The last chapter is about disorders and treatment. And the story here is fundamentally one of loss of control. This is really the common thread that underlies most of the di different disorders we're going to talk about. In one way or another, they're all about this kind of cognitive control. And as we've emphasized throughout the course, development of control, as we saw in the last chapter, is such a critical step in how we form our uh, understanding of ourself and can take control of our own behavior and try to have a feeling of control in this even chaotic world. And so that, that notion of yourself being this kind of agent that's in control is so critical to kind of healthy, normal functioning of the brain. And when that gets challenged, it just has all kinds of major repercussions. And so uh, a lot of what we're going to be seeing is there's some kind of primary uh, challenge to this feeling of control. And then that causes all these kind of secondary effects. And so understanding the whole cascade of uh, this uh, loss of control, this perceived loss of control, helps us really understand also why therapy is so effective. And so this really ends up being a very kind of uh, emergent, uh, you know, psychological kind of understanding of a lot of these disorders. Certainly there's some role for biological uh, differences and some kind of, you know, trigger effects that precipitate these types of events. But ultimately, the real phenomenology here is, is really psychological. And, you know, that has a lot of consequences that we'll see. But it also suggests why therapy, which actually turns out to be remarkably effective, is so effective. Because really, the problem is psychological at some level. And then, therefore, the solution is also can be psychological. So those are some of the big themes we're going to be looking at. Uh, the prevalence of disorders is remarkably high in the population. Here's a graph of the data from the United States in 2017. Uh, roughly 20% of people are suffering from some form of mental disorder, recognized, categorized mental disorder at any given point in time. And there's an, you know 50% cumulative kind of lifetime risk. So basically you have even odds at some point in your life of suffering from some kind of mental disorder. It's astounding. It's a huge, huge problem, right? I mean, it's a huge level of, of prevalence of these disorders. Uh, if we look at what these disorders are, that kind of makes a lot of sense. If you especially look at the top ones here, anxiety, depression, drug use, alcohol, it's kind of like, yeah, everybody experiences anxiety. Everybody experiences some form of depression. And we'll see, you know, at some point that crosses over some kind of threshold here where we now say, oh, that's a disorder level of this kind of uh, situation. And so another big set of issues we'll be looking at is, you know, what, what qualifies this as a disorder as opposed to just kind of normal everyday life. Uh, but you can see here, these, these kinds of top four uh, level uh, disorders are really significant. And then you get down into these other cases here, which are kind of below a percent. Um, and these tend to be uh, also very uh, damaging and important, but also sort of less high frequency. Um, this schizophrenia is really the kind of most prototypical in the media presentations of, of mental disorders. Schizophrenia is really kind of the, the prototype. Um, and so we'll talk a lot about what's going on with that. So another major theme is comorbidity, which is this finding that if you have one uh, disorder, you're often very likely to also be categorized as having another one. Uh, so you get uh, a co-occurrence is probably a better word. Morbidity sounds a bit uh, bad, uh, but it's basically just means you have multiple disorders at the same time. Uh, and in particular, it tends to be that you also get kind of anxiety or depression on top of anything else that you might have, okay? So if you have depression, you get anxiety. If you have anxiety, you get depression. But also if you have schizophrenia, you also get depression and anxiety. It's not just everything tends to co-occur with everything else. Uh, there are other co-occurrences, but there are particular ones. And these are very informative uh, and we can understand what's going on according to a 
framework that's kind of gaining popularity in, in the clinical world, which is called the network model. Uh, and I think of it in terms of attractor dynamics, uh, which is something that we see in neural networks. And it's uh, been something that comes out of uh, kind of dynamic systems theory. You, you have this kind of dynamic system that's evolving over time. Um, and, and you can kind of plot the trajectory of the evolution of that system over time uh, in, in terms of this kind of conceptual idea uh, that you kind of have a, a physical space here, you know, and you might have different kinds of symptoms that you're plotting basically as your space. Um, it could be any kind of different sort of states that you're plotting over time. And then you have a trajectory uh, and the idea is that, you know, you go through over time a variety of different kind of states. And this is really the network idea that you're kind of progressing in a network of symptoms and states of mind, frames of mind over time. And that's kind of plotted in this trajectory. And so you're kind of spiraling down in this case, kind of metaphorically into this attractor state. Uh, and, and that attractor state is kind of like this kind of negative, vicious cycle that's kind of like, uh, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm no longer in control of my, my own system. I, I, nothing's meaningful. I can't do what I want to do. You know, everything is horrible. All this kind of negative affect, uh, you're anxious, you're afraid. Um, so all of those kinds of emotional states and patterns of thought and belief are, are really what constitute these kind of states and progressions that you go through on this kind of downward spiral. Um, and the other thing that's really important that this kind of notion of, of the attractor gives us is that you can kind of start off in different places in this large space of different potential kind of, you know, states of mind and uh, different states of, of how your brain is working, you know, different uh, factors that might be going on, some of which may be biological and some of which may be just kind of, you know, as a result of experience and all kinds of different things. No matter where you kind of start out in all these different kind of etiologies, uh, starting points, um, the the attractor state is strong, is strong enough that it kind of sucks you into that same point. And so this is really this kind of uh, attractive notion, so to speak, of the attractor state is that it explains why so many different heterogeneous kinds of starting points, so many different heterogeneous kinds of uh, original etiologies all end up sharing sort of similar overall features. Uh, these, these kind of depression and anxiety kinds of phenotypes uh, and diagnoses because so many different forces all kind of take you to the same place. But it also gives us a really important clue as to how therapy can be particularly beneficial in treating disorders. And this is because essentially, because we have this kind of trajectory and this trajectory is really, again, a psychological phenomenon. It's about states of mind. It's about patterns of thought, patterns of affect, uh, things that are actually happening that you're aware of and that potentially you can gain control over. And this uh, ability to gain control over these states really depends on having some help. Typically, uh, some people are able to kind of get themselves out of these states by, on their own. But uh, we now know that uh, therapy, particular, you know, useful directed forms of coaching and input and discussion and uh, strategies that a person can provide to you and, and, and critically having actually a, a real relationship that develops with the therapist called the therapeutic alliance um, can actually build back these critical kind of feelings of self-worth and control and self-efficacy that then can spiral you back out of those states. And so often in our daily lives, we're kind of actually in this kind of other attractor state of being uh, positively buoyed by, uh, you know, unreasonable, as we talked about uh, in the social psychology chapter, uh, unreasonable feelings of self-worth and, you know, everybody thinks they're above average. And so you have this kind of positive bubble, essentially, that's, that's uh, immunizing you against all the threats out there in, in the world. Uh, and really, so depression and anxiety are when that bubble kind of bursts uh, and you kind of really, you know, lose your ability to fend off these shields 
uh, of the outside, uh, you know, threats and, and influences, and you succumb to them. And then now uh, the process of therapy and the process of rebuilding is one of essentially rebooting, rebuilding that whole sense of self-efficacy, self-control, reinflating your own personal bubble and, and becoming uh, kind of energized and, and re- uh, capable of taking on all the challenges that we face in, in dealing with the real world. I think, you know, these, these kind of metaphors give us some, some important insights into uh, sort of the dynamic aspects of how these disorders operate. And they also suggest that, you know, drug treatments are not probably in many cases actually uh, treating the underlying symptoms. The underlying symptoms are most likely, you know, there may be some initial kind of events, these etiologies that kind of tip you off into one direction or another. And the drugs may help you kind of get a little bit of a jump start out of this attractor state. But fundamentally, the attractor state is a psychological phenomenon. And that explains why therapy is, again, effective as it is, and also why drugs may not be necessarily the best strategy for most people in these in these situations